it says that we are live yet again and we are back welcome back to everything eos the longest running eos podcast thank you all so much for joining us on this friday as we look back in the last week in eos and eos io and we have a lot of stuff to cover this week but first things first if you're new here smash that subscribe button oh, yeah. whether you're new or returning hit that like button and leave a go eos in the live chat so that we know you were here with us live and of course, the last thing I have to mention was that the things that Zach and I say should never be taken as legal, financial, tax, professional, or any other kind of advice. We're just two people talking about open source software, and uh, this is purely for entertainment purposes only. And the final part is that any tokens we mention in the, so in the show, you can safely assume that we own for disclosure purposes. Hey, any Zach. company we mention, just assume we own it. Just, just assume <laughs> we own everything. Just assume everything's a big lie. Don't listen to anyone on the internet. You can't trust anyone. Uh, you'll, you'll get wrecked if you do. Um, we're just here to educate the EOS community on what's going on, and we're excited about it ourselves personally. We'll share that excitement, and we'll tell you everything going on in the news. So one more reminder, smash the likes. Uh, if you're not watching live, leave a comment. If you're in the live chat, leave a, leave a message in there. But uh, let's kick it off with the EOS name service news. You got some exciting new uh, names that you uh, just picked up a couple, I don't know how recently it was. You just told me today. <laughs> yeah, this is just uh, today and yesterday as well. We added another one. So we have four new suffixes available on eosnameservice.io. Uh, these are pretty cool. I'm actually really excited about these. We have .dsp for DAP service providers on the DAP network. We have .trade, which I think is pretty cool. .nl for the Netherlands and .jobs. And somebody already got Steve.jobs, but there are <laughs> lots of awesome names still available. So head on over to eosnameservice.io and uh, pick up your new custom accounts. Uh, I'm pretty excited about them. I, I can't check. I don't have a block explorer in front of me doing this live show, but I, I, I would assume that the .dsp probably already got a few purchases just because as, as soon as you told me that it was available, I ran like a little girl and told everybody about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I've seen a few come in. And unfortunately, obviously, the, the total names are li limited to 12 characters. So blockstart.dsp from Ramon and unfortunately doesn't work, but uh, shorter ones do, so it's pretty exciting. So we're, we are exactly uh, one week from Halloween now, and we are finally starting to get the Hallow EOS submissions. You want to remind yeah. everyone what that is and how yep. they could join? Absolutely. Hallow EOS is Cypher Glass's annual pumpkin carving contest where we give away 350 EOS in prizes to the top three winners that submit an EOS themed pumpkin carving. So it's pretty cool. We got amazing submissions last year and we have two really good submissions already for this year. So right now they're the only two people. So they are guaranteed to win right now if nobody else enters. So it, the third person that enters will also be guaranteed to win unless more people enter. So now is the time to do it. Get an extra pumpkin, carve an EOS theme pumpkin carving, and uh, submit it to at CypherglassBP on Twitter with hashtag HalloEOS, and you could win 200 EOS as that first place prize. I'm gonna have to, I'm just going to scroll through the top post till I get some from last year. People need some inspiration here. we got to get some pumpkins. Absolutely. You can get a ton of EOS. The price just popped, even though it's back to where it was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, like, this is a big deal. Don't you have some, Who are the judges? Didn't you have some, like... EOS celebrity yeah. judges or something? Yeah, it's myself. It's Han from Node One. It's uh, Joe Chiapetta from Pixios, who's an artist over there, and uh, two other people that we will likely reveal soon. So, uh, good judging panel this year. Exciting. All right. So, I scrolled through some. A lot of these are from last year. Like we said, only two entries this year. So, there is a ton of EOS up for grabs right now. And it's, yeah. it's uh, all yours if you have some uh, artistic uh, bones in your body. Uh, I think we have one more, one more piece of Cypher Glass news to get through with Adriana. Uh, the Cypher Glass community manager oh, she'll yeah, be so speaking at the conference here. Absolutely. She'll be speaking uh, at World Crypto Conference next week in Las Vegas. This is on October 30th to 31st. So uh, if you're going to be there, go see Adriana speak. It, it should be awesome. It'll incorporate EOS. And uh, there's this whole EOS pavilion that I think Brock and some other people are putting on at that World Crypto Conference. So EOS will have a very real presence there. And uh, I'm excited to see what Adriana talks about. I, I think it'll be a really good presentation. Yeah, I, I, I think it was probably hard, hard for them to like throw this together. I think, I, I, don't, I don't know what happened with it, but it seemed like it, it, it just, like they were rapidly planning it because I think the EOS community conference was so close to it being like, what, uh, what was that, like a week ago in, in Rio? Yeah. And yeah, then th week. this is just like two weeks later. So I'm sure like everyone's travel budgets are pushed, but this is in the United States. So if you guys... Uh, want to go? I I know plane tickets from Pittsburgh are only 150 bucks. You could head out there. So World CryptoCon is actually a much bigger conference, and that's 
uh, why I wanted to bring up the fact that Adrian is speaking there, along with uh, Peter K from uh, Dappiness, Everything EOS, and nice. Liquid Apps. Uh, Evan Schindler from Dappiness will be speaking there. Oh, nice. Ben Sigmund, Crystal Rose, Brock Pierce. There's a bunch. Of, ba basically, anyone in the EOS community on the West Coast is probably speaking there because it's so close. Uh, Fred Kruger from Lynx. Nice. Um, but the more exciting part, even though I love EOS, the more exciting part is the conference outside of EOS. So one of my biggest complaints uh, going to big crypto conferences like uh, Blockchain Week in Korea, like Consensus Week in New York City, is that EOS doesn't have a big presence at the major crypto conferences. And that's what this one is. You see on the screen, we've got Hoskinson. I'm sure he's going to love the EOS Pavilion. <laughs> Uh, Pomp, uh, people from Calibra, which is the, the Libra wallet, Charlie Shrem, obviously Brock Pierce. Uh, yeah, so there's just a, a lot of big names here. Alex Mashinsky, nice. Bact, blah, blah, blah. Galaxy Digital, uh, PNC Bank, Flexa. Uh, it, it's just a big conference. So it, I'm excited about the EOS Pavilion having a small, or it's, it's a pretty big role. I mean, they have a whole like section it's of the huge conference. Huge section, yeah. yeah. It's, like it's their whole, they have their whole stage. So yeah. there's like multiple stages at this conference. Some conferences only have like one main stage and then some have like a main stage and some auxiliary stages. I'm assuming that this one's like that where I have some auxiliary stages and the EOS Pavilion will be uh, one of them. But it's like a, a full schedule. The entire conference has EOS speakers uh, both days. I, I saw this Absolutely. schedule and yeah. I named most of the speakers. And speaking of uh, speakers and upcoming EOS events, we have Blocksburg Ooh. in Block One's hometown of Blacksburg, Virginia, coming up on November 10th to 12th. And Zach and I will both be there. And uh, it looks like we were talking before this call. It looks like a bunch of new speakers were added to the to the website. Is that yeah. Right? Uh, so yeah, we haven't brought this up in a while because I mean, this conference is also two two and a half weeks away. This conference is actually a big reason I'm not going to Las Vegas because I was just in Korea earlier this month. I'm going to be in Blacksburg, uh, November 10th through the 12th, possibly the 9th. I'll get into that in a second. Um, and then I'll be in Israel uh, later this month also. But but nice. before I, before I get into what? that stuff, we get it. I was going to say, what are you doing in Israel? Oh, uh, got some liquid app stuff. Te team, The whole oh, team's okay. getting together globally, like the global team's getting together for uh, something exciting. Uh, we should oh, have wow. news on that within the next couple of days, ho hopefully over the weekend, but latest on so, so well, Sunday is like the first day of the week in Israel, so it might be Sunday or Monday, but uh, just stay oh, tuned okay. to the liquid apps channels. But I, I really want to stay on this Blocksburg topic here yeah, I, because we, we haven't talked about it in a while because there hasn't been a whole lot of new news. They added like a speaker here and there, but they, they added some heavy hitters. So I'm going to, I'm going to start from the top here. I'm not sure what this Emergo company is. Uh, it's, uh, it has to do with Cardano. It's, it's part of the Cardano foundation uh, or whatever it is. Interesting. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I mean, I guess I, I could have just read that. I yeah. wonder uh, what, what he says. So the CTO of a company working on Cardano. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, we talked about Paul Brigner, I think, uh, because he was already on here. Fundopolis, uh, th where's the big one? Here it is. IBM Blockchain Solutions. Uh, and do you remember, uh, like, before the mainnet launched, when Dan did his, like, very first uh, Virginia Tech, like, uh, seminar speech? Like, oh, yeah. April yeah, 2018? Big group of students. I remember at the end of it, someone asked, like, how does Block One make money? And yeah. he, he, like, gave a couple of examples. And he said, like, consulting for, like, enterprise corporations. And one of the companies he name dropped was IBM. Uh, Interesting. That doesn't mean anything's going on. That doesn't mean this Ryan guy has anything to do with that. Right. But uh, this is, like, a heavily influenced Block One conference. It's being held at Virginia Tech, which is, like, right in the backyard of Block One. Block One is in, like, a VT, like, office, like, uh, park. All right. So let's continue on. Capital Capital One. Rob, Rob what, what, what's Capital One? Isn't that, like, a huge bank? Oh, yeah. I mean, they're a huge. Uh, I know they're a credit card company. I think they have a bank, uh, a huge traditional finance company. It's pretty yeah. wild. So they're going to be talking about their enterprise. And then we got the CTO of Eva, the, the Uber yeah. on EOS IO ride sharing platform, which is live today, mind you. They're drivers uh, doing ride sharing in Canada, in, in Quebec, I believe. Uh, this is actually a real business. It's going on right now. And uh, from what I hear, they might be expanding to some new cities over the next couple of months. Uh, so uh, maybe they'll be announcing what where those cities are. I don't know. Nice. So the one I'm really excited about on here is uh, Ritesh, I believe is how you say his name, the co-founder and CTO at Moonlighting, which we oh, yeah. know is uh, really the most used app right now uh, based on the total number of users, 750,000 users that are using this platform and using the benefits of blockchain tech through 
the DAP network. So pretty awesome that he'll be there and can kind of shed some light on that tech and how they're using it as well. Yeah, and if you look at his profile, he has another connection to the, the Capital One. He has 18 years experience covering various aspects of software architecture, design, development, process, and methodology for Capital One. So yeah. there's an, another connection there. And then Dan the Man, obviously he's still there. Hester Pierce, the SEC commissioner. Uh, Lee Schneider, the one that basically got the SEC off of <laughs> Block One's back. This is like Shout the man Lee. of the hour. Uh, Dan Larimer might be the uh, keynote speaker here. But Lee Schneider is the man. Uh, then we got uh, Accenture, which I looked up. This is a $41.6 billion uh, co revenue company. It's a wow. huge tech company. Uh, they have two people there from there. And then they have Brian Sullivan from CB CNBC's Worldwide Exchange. Oh, wow. Uh, before we move on, I just want to point out the program, a few cool things. The very opening thing on the program is the SEC commissioner with the CNBC anchor, so I don't know if this is potentially going to be something that might air on, on CNBC or what, but it's very interesting with all of the ongoing uh, regulations in the U.S. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what Hester Pierce has to say about the current state of uh, oh, yeah. crypto regulation. Well, she just proposed recently something uh, about a, a three-year safe harbor law for tokens so that you could issue a token and not be treated as a security for three years. So they sort of give you the time to innovate, you know, put out your idea, distribute your token, sell it, whatever you want to do, um, and effectively revisit it after that point. So Hester That's Pierce amazing. has been a champion for good regulation of blockchain tech and of tokens and ICOs and all these things. So uh, I'm glad to see that she's getting more time in the spotlight here as well. And maybe she'll talk about that potential grace period. I mean, that, that would be amazing. Yeah. Then, then session two, blockchain in the enterprise. Uh, the technology partner lead from Amazon Web Services. That's an interesting person wow. to, be at, to be at a blockchain conference in Blacksburg. Interesting. Yeah, well, interesting. Yeah. AWS does have a blockchain component where you can sort of spin up a blockchain on AWS, which is kind of interesting. So maybe we'll see EOSIO incorporated into that in some way in the future, just mm -hmm. like we might see IBM add EOSIO to their current Hyperledger lineup. Mm -hmm. And then Moog, they're like a defense contractor. Uh, here's the IBM food, if, if, if it's food trust, I'm guessing it's supply chain, Accenture again. And then the student demos. And then of course, on the final day, before lunch, of course, because most people leave after lunch, uh, Dan Larimer, keynote speaker. So oh. the, the reason this is such a big deal is one, I don't care what's being said publicly. No one's told me this, but Block One has their hands all over this thing. They have such a great relationship with Virginia Tech. I'm sure they played a part in figuring out who some of these guests are, but it is a Virginia Tech conference. So Virginia Tech is in charge. So none of these speakers necessarily have anything to do with Block One, but they're all gonna be at the same place at the same time. They're gonna be, all, all of the speakers usually have their own little like private lunches and stuff uh, during the event where they all get to mingle. And then all of these big companies are gonna see who's the keynote speaker at this conference. Oh, it, it's Dan Larimer, the guy that's built three successful blockchains and has the most scalable uh, blockchain ever. So absolutely, and I think what's exciting. What's exciting about all this also is that last time we talked about this, the ticket price was $500, which is pretty steep for a conference like this. But fortunately, the ticket price has dropped all the way down to 150 bucks. So if you're in the area, if you're a few hours away and you're driving up, we would love to see you there. So 150 bucks, uh, we'll leave a link in the live chat right now uh, where you can buy the tickets. Yeah, so that, that, I, I'm glad you remember that. I would have just skipped on to the next topic, but this is a huge deal. Like there, there should be no barrier of entry. Anyone who uh, lives within a couple hour drive, there's no big airport that goes into Blacksburg or Blacksburg. Uh, but I, I'm definitely driving distance, so I'll be driving, making the five-hour yeah. haul. And I, I also wanted to point out that the day before this, so this event's November 10th through the 12th, the day before is a Saturday. It's going to be November 9th. The University of Pittsburgh, my local university, my wife's alma mater, uh, and Virginia Tech will be playing in football. Uh, the time of the game oh, is nice. yeah. The time of the game hasn't been announced yet. Uh, so if it's an evening game, I will be buying tickets to that game. I will hold off on buying tickets until I uh, hear from the community. I would love to go to a Virginia Tech uh, University of Pittsburgh football game with the, anyone who wants to join from the US community. Anyone from Block One, you want to chill, have some beers. Uh, that's where I will be the day before if it's a night game. That sounds awesome. I've been to uh, a couple of Virginia Tech games before with my dad who graduated from there as well. So it, it's a crazy experience. One of the loudest college football stadiums with the people jumping up and down and screaming. Yeah. So I don't, I don't even know how they're, they're doing this year. I know Pitt, awesome. Pitt sucks this year. I don't know how no, gotcha. Virginia Tech's going, but I, I, I love going to away stadiums in any sport. Um, 
But anyway, we've been talking about Blocksburg for a really long time. The most bullish news out of the day, and somewhat controversial to some people, yeah. is the news coming out of China. You want to kick this one off, Rob? Yeah, so President Xi Jinping, I believe is how you say it, uh, President of the People's Republic of China, basically came out and said that China should, quote, seize the opportunity to adopt blockchain technology. He even talked a little bit about developing blockchain technology potentially. So what's so interesting about this is that on one hand, it's incredibly bullish because the, the country that is the largest in the world by population is saying, hey, we want to embrace this new technology and, and really use it for all it's worth. And on the other hand, it's it's actually, it's kind of dystopic in a way, because if you think about this, this communist regime, this sort of uh, dictatorship uh, there are a lot of negative aspects of the government that they have over in China, at least from my perspective as an American. And because of that, it's likely that whatever blockchain technology that they end up developing will be like the worst black mirror <laughs> version of this thing where they're monitoring everybody's transactions and, and basically using it to further surveil their citizens. So that is sort of the unfortunate part about this. But the one thing that I think a lot of people are hitting on correctly is that this should finally, finally give the U.S. the kick in the butt it needs oh, to yeah. embrace blockchain tech and stop regulating it away overseas. And I think that's where Hester Pierce comes in with this potential three-year safe harbor for tokens. There's all these different pieces that are sort of falling into place where because of the U.S.'s constant global war with China, this could really be the kick oh, yeah. that they need to go over the edge and say, hey, we as a country are going to adopt blockchain tech. We're going to keep the entrepreneurs and innovators here and allow our society to benefit. So that is why I'm so excited about this news, not because China will have their own sort of Black Mirror-esque dystopic blockchain in the mm -hmm. future, but because this should give the USA the kick they need to, to make it happen here. And I, I pulled the tweet up on the screen. Uh, Brian Armstrong, the CEO of, of uh, Coinbase, that's what he tweeted. The race is on. Absolutely. I mean, like competition is going to, to breed innovation. And hopefully this, because of the trade war with China, is going to give the US the kick in the ass to realize if, if, if you sit this one out, like you're going to, it's going to take you a whole generation or two to catch back up. Just look at like all of the other uh, big races, like the United States has been in and won, like the, like the space race and then like the Cold War and things like that. Like that's whenever they pump the most money into innovation. And oh, yeah. They were the I leaders. Mean, like in our, our generation, our parents' generation, or even our grandparents' generations, like the, the U.S. has kind of been like the superpower, which doesn't mean it's going to last forever. It's got to end sometime. And th this this might be the catalyst. If, if we don't innovate and if we don't uh, adopt uh, the, the cutting edge businesses that are happening in blockchain, there, I have no doubt that the U.S. is going to be left behind. And especially if like the, the fiat monetary system like collapses like so many experts are predicting like it's just a recipe for disaster and this is this is the opportunity to kind of like change the tide of things from the u.s perspective but we'll, we'll see absolutely and the, the internet is a great comparison to this obviously crypto gets compared to the internet a lot but when you think about the internet and how the United States as a whole, from a market perspective, from an innovation perspective, from a, a business perspective, really embraced the internet and all the new companies that came with it. That's why pretty much all of the world's largest services today, with the exception of China specific ones and things like that, um, they are all American companies, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Google, all these massive Microsoft, the, the list goes on and on, Apple, all of these massive companies are American companies because the U.S. embraced that tech and mm -hmm. made a home for entrepreneurs to innovate. So I'm really hoping they do the same thing for blockchain tech or, like you said, we'll just be left behind and our citizens will suffer as a result. Well, the the, the one bullish thing uh, about the, the, the China coming out with this is, well, first I want to point out that they said blockchain, not crypto, I believe, from yep. everything I've read. So that's number one to point out. And number two is that the Chinese CCID uh, Research Institute has been ranking EOS IO the number one blockchain tech every single month, basically since it came out. So uh, there's really no other blockchain that's scalable enough to run like a digital or like a, a nationwide like monetary system. And I don't know if that's like step one for China. It's like probably step 100. 50,000. Uh, but it, it's definitely, on, I don't know. I don't know where it's at on the radar, but it's still... Uh, yeah. it'll be interesting to follow. Let's, let's just say that much. Um, yeah. And if there's, if there's one thing, the last thing I'll say, if there's one thing China is known for, it's they're known for moving very quickly, building highways in a day, building new buildings in a week. So I expect them to move quickly on this as well. And maybe we'll see a, a digital version um, of their currency launch soon as well. What, what's this? Someone, are you working with the same dappiness? I heard Vitalik. What the fuck? Oh, interesting. $10 donation from Xander Sauce. So you were going to say, I heard Zach talking about a recent Ethereum panel. 
maybe a different dampiness, but the, the dampiness he's, I think he's referring to is uh, the one you're involved with, the uh, yeah. Dapp Development Agency. Yeah, I, okay. <laughs> that threw me off a little bit. Okay, so yeah. um, Galaxy Digital, huge news. Not a lot of people have been talking about it. I, I think it only came out yesterday, though, so I think they will be talking about it after we, we point out a few interesting aspects of this here. So uh, Galaxy Digital, the EOS VC arm of G Galaxy Digital, it doesn't say it on this tweet, but in the article it does, uh, they invested in a mobile-only bank for a $20 million Series B and this isn't even the first bank that EOS VC has invested in. It's actually the second bank. Um, so anyone who's been following EOS VC for the last year or so, last December 2018, uh, Galaxy Digital invested and led in a round of a uh, $30 million Series A with a, a bank called Good Money. And Good Money had like a crypto aspect to it as like for social good. And it had some sort of like, I don't want to call it a dividend, but there is a yield component to their bank accounts. And that, that bank's been qu kind of quiet. And I think it's been quiet because that one hinders heavily, heavily, heavily on regulation because of yeah. the crypto aspect. Whereas this bank, as, as far as I could tell, uh, it doesn't really have a crypto component to it, but that's almost a benefit because the crypto component bank is uh, with good money. This bank could be a blockchain tech play. I, I'm not sure, but um, so I, I, the reason I wasn't as excited about this news at first was one, I didn't see it until like late last night, but two, I was reading like coin telegraph and stuff and coin, uh, the, whatever the block one posted, but I didn't go to the site itself. Whenever I went to the court, the, to current.com, which is the name of the bank. And I saw the way that they're describing this, this, uh, deal that happened. It seems like a much bigger deal. And they pointed out something that was in none of the coin telegraph articles. And that's the fact that they already have 500,000 customers and they're an operating FDIC insured bank currently with wow. visa partnerships and debit cards. This is all that's happening awesome. today. Yeah. It seems like a good example of, you know, a lot of these USVC investments, I think are not necessarily going to use crypto in some way and have a token involved, but may use the blockchain technology on the back end to improve settlement times or reduce settlement costs and things like that. So I imagine as is a requirement of USVC that they'll be using USIO in some way. But then if, if all the chains get connected one day and it's just one big mesh network and the, the web 3.0 actually happens. Yeah. Then, then what happens? Then it's just all one big thing, and it doesn't matter if you're EOS IO or EOS or Talos or Wordle. It doesn't matter anymore. Well, just EOS IO. That's sort of the the future that I see here developing, especially with things like uh, the DAP network and and kind of being that layer two, almost middleware like solution for all these different blockchains to help connect them. So mm -hmm. incredibly exciting times where we can kind of see the direction where this space is headed. All right. So that's is that all for the USVC? I think I was going to talk more about the good money, but we don't need to. Uh, what else did I miss? Oh, they, I want to point out the USVC companies. We haven't talked about USVC in a while. I just oh, wanna, yeah, that's right. Let's do it. I just want to real quick, just as a reminder for anyone who like isn't a nerd like us following them, I'm just going to pull up the USVC page on uh, the Block One website. Just to show you some of these companies, like there are a lot of companies that have been invested in like a YouTube company, a, a Twitch streaming company, a digital identity company called Helix. Uh, I don't even know half of these. The High Fidelity, the founder of Second Life, uh, basically has a decentralized blockchain based VR world. We've got Everpedia, Good Money, the bank I mentioned uh, before. Uh, just so many companies, man. Like we haven't like heard waves from them. They've just been building. And, and that's the exciting part is like, we haven't seen anything from any of these companies except for one. And that's the one building on DAP network. And that's the moonlighting project. Yeah, uh, absolutely. None of the other ones ha have pushed anything to production yet as far as, oh, Upland also. Upland's been making waves. We should give them a shout out too. Cause Dirk, Dirk's a cool guy. Oh, we, we've, yeah, Dirk from Upland's a great guy. Very cool. Sorry, I think we got a bit of a delay there. What happened? Sorry, I think we had a delay. I, I didn't mean to talk over you. If you oh. want to continue, you could. You, we were talking about Dirk. You could. Oh, chime okay. in. <laughs> I was saying that. Yeah, Upland is pretty cool with that property trading game, and then also Mythical Games. Um, their first game that's coming out soon, Blancos. We we don't have a release date for that. I think it should still be this year, according to their most recent updated Telegram. But uh, I have played the Blancos demo at South by Southwest Gaming this year, and it was incredibly fun. I got a bunch of the cards collected and ready to go. So uh, not too many of them, though. I, I think I'm I'm holding on to most of them, but I'm looking forward to the game. Mm -hmm. Uh, so about the bank, let's get back to the banking. Cause there, there's 
Uh, is my thing still on full screen? Hold on. Wyoming. Boom. Uh, I gotta get back to my full screen here. Uh, the other thing, so with, with all of the banking, the most interesting aspect about the banking as, uh, part is the fiat on ramp and off ramp. Like that's always like onboarding into crypto and offboarding out of crypto is always like one of, one of the hard, hardest things for people to do because for and the let me backtrack. This Wyoming cloud company, every like everyone's done a video on this already, so we're probably just preaching to the choir here. But we just want to point it out that. Uh, through this Wyoming cloud company, and they probably incorporated in Wyoming. Don't they have like the most uh, crypto friendly laws in the United States or in, I guess, definitely the United States other than Puerto Oh, yeah, Rico. absolutely. I mean, uh, Caitlin Long has been a, a tremendous help um, in that regard in the same way that, or I guess a similar way that Hester Pierce is sort of champion in the SEC. Caitlin Long is champion in the Wyoming government and uh, Wyoming cloud is actually using uh, those new beneficial laws to provide the ability to buy EOS resources, EOS eff effectively, uh, with a credit card and without KYC. So if you're looking to do that in small purchases up to, uh, I believe, $200, uh, you can do that at wycloud.io, stands for Wyoming Cloud, of course. It's interesting looking at this because it's like uh, you're buying resources. Like you're buying, yeah. the, instead of buying EOS, they're pitching it as no, you're not. Uh, you are getting EOS, but that's a side product of the CPU, net, and RAM you're buying. Absolutely. So they're, they're selling it as the, as the resources because, like, when you buy a package from Amazon, uh, you're not really it, – it's it's not treated that way. Uh, this, this is just uh, with the token system. So we'll see how, how this plays out. It's a very interesting concept, but I think where the most value is here is, like, for gaming. So you figure if you – even if I could onboard, like, my nephew – onto a, like prospectors or some blockchain based game. If I can get them a free wallet somehow or, or just buy them a wallet through the app store, if, if they wanna start buying items, like how do they get fiat into that crypto game? And the, the, they typically have to go through some sort of uh, multi-day KYC process and an ACH process or like a high credit card fee. Uh, but now with a PayPal account, you'd be able to buy like 10 bucks, top up your kid's account, and then they could buy their in-game items there without actually feeling like they did anything crypto related. They don't have to go to an exchange. Absolutely. Uh, and that I think is really how it needs to be for mass adoption. This uh, obviously doesn't take us the full way there where we need it, but it takes us one significant step closer in making it super easy to buy EOS with PayPal. So pretty exciting. I just want to give a shout out to Wombat Wallet. Uh, yeah. I don't think we've ever mentioned Wombat Wallet, but they've been making waves. Uh, they they are a good product. Uh, it's another wallet. Uh, they have an account recovery feature, which is pretty cool. But the reason I'm bringing them up today is because they also take credit cards to, to buy up to $250 without KYC through a carbon integration. And they already started using the, the free resources for their users also, which is really cool. So days like today, whenever the congestion hits, which we'll get into that topic, I think two topics from now, uh, you're good to go, which is a cool feature there. And uh, what other feature did they have? Oh, I, I wanted to point out that, um, what is it? Karma. Karma just en enacted that too. They started uh, billing CPU resources for their users. So nice. we, talk we talked about how with 1.8, you could bill resources to, to the DAP developer instead of to the users. And uh, Karma was one of the first projects, I think, to do that. I think Nudex, I, I don't want to, don't quote me on either of these, but I think Nudex also started doing theirs already too, but I'm yeah, not Nudex sure. Yeah, Nudex does it for VIPs if you have a certain amount of NDX tokens. Um, if you're just a normal user, no NDX, I don't believe they do it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's cool to see people using those new features, and I'm glad they're finally activated for sure. The, the last thing that we wanted to point out uh, on this kind of banking theme is eoslocally.com, which is a peer-to-peer -peer EOS exchange uh, in person, I believe, that's being mm -hmm. used uh, predominantly in South America. So a very cool way to buy it as well, eoslocally.com. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, I don't, I don't know how they're, they're working with regulators and things like that either, because like there's always been, a, what was it, Local Bitcoins was a big site for a long time. Yeah. I mean, it's still a big thing. They just, it's got KYC. That's all. I, I think KYC, I think like we talked about yeah, a couple exactly. different non KYC got, uh, options, but like when you use a credit card to buy something, it's not a KYC necessarily, but if they, it still stops like big money laundering and terrorism. Cause if they want to find you, if they're looking for you, they could follow the, the, the paper trail, but it, it's, I guess more private than, than using an exchange. I think that's the difference there. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Got, and got much, through some much easier to use. Uh, we we got to get into yeah. that, that, that damn governance topic. It never stops. Here we go. Go governance. <laughs> it, 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 so let's just start. I guess we'll just pull up the Brendan Bloomer tweet and we will say that like yeah. governance will never be fixed. Is the U.S. government is the U.S. government fixed? Is the oh, certainly not. government in the U.K. fixed? Like is government ever 
working perfectly? Uh, I don't think so, for sure. Uh, Brendan Bloomer came out with a tweet. He said, EOS governance is defined by the majority of voting tokens and by definition is working perfectly. Discussions around EOS evolution are productive, but calls to fix governance are unnecessarily divisive. Let's evolve EOS together as one community and in the interest of all. So what do you think of this tweet, Zach? Uh, it, it stirred up a lot of controversy. I only have the, the, the original tweet up on this screen. I don't know if I'm going to pull up all the replies or not, but like, he is right though. Like, and I, I think our headline, I don't know if it was on my thumbnail I made or the headline, but like solving governance, I think is the term I used. And I, I think he does make a good point that like you can never solve or fix government or governance. So like it's just bad terminology, I guess, to use. I, I will agree with that because I think governance and government is something that should always be evolving. And he says evolve EOS together and it should always be iterating and improving. And that's what we're trying to do right now is we're trying to iterate and improve. Uh, because I don't think things are broken beyond control right now. Like, the, how would you describe the current situation? Because nothing's getting stolen. Uh, like, no one's pillaging the, the worker proposal funds. Uh, we're getting DDoS right now. But how, how yeah, do you I feel right that, now? Uh, ultimately, on governance, I'm optimistic that something that, like, a modified version of the new EOS New York proposal will come out that really does, as Brendan says, evolve EOS together and in the interest of all. I think everybody benefits in that new system, but it's a matter of reaching consensus on whatever this new proposal will be and then implementing it on chain because EOS New York even put out um, sort of the, the list of steps that it would take to implement their proposal on chain. And that, that part of it is actually fairly straightforward. But what's not so straightforward is how do we as a globally diverse community reach consensus on which one we want to actually implement on chain. And I think that's mm -hmm. the challenge everybody's having now um, and, and part of the reason why I think some people are bearish, but ultimately in the long term, I am very optimistic uh, that this will get resolved in a way that that is, you know, in the interest of all. I just pulled up uh, one of the replies. Colin Talks Crypto said, operating as defined is one thing, but op operating optimally is another. Uh, when we have one entity controlling multiple BPs, I'd say it's not optimal, even if it's performing as defined. One T, Absolutely. one V will go a long way to improving things. I agree 100% there. And I think one token, one vote's the one thing that uh, I, I think almost everyone agrees on is in both Dan's proposal and Dio's New York's proposal uh, with just a slight variation. But I, I think having the divisible one token, one vote, I, I think would be a good uh, step forward as far as a plan of action, because I think any governance evolution that happens it's going to happen over with a multi-phased multi-staged approach and I, I think the one token one vote will be a good uh starting point but i call it colin is correct though uh it, like bps getting pushed out of paid positions that sucks for for a lot of these independent bps that's one thing but it's not like they're getting pushed out by like uh like big tech companies or anything like that they're, whenever they're getting pushed out by by second BP. So you have a top 21 BP running a second BP in like the position like 40 through 50. Like that's whenever it starts getting bothersome with, without having the one token, one vote. And that's whenever it's not working optimally. Yeah. But um, th there's a lot of stuff that's been coming out. Uh, I know Gray Mass put out an article. I'm going to, if you want to talk for a second, I'm going to pull up some articles so I can show them on screen for everyone. Sure. Yeah. There's a Gray Mass article called How Vote Incentivization Monopolizes DPoS or Delegate Approved Mistake. Talks a little bit about the current issues. Uh, EOS Amsterdam came out with Dan's staking pool and the future of governance. And uh, ultimately, there are a lot of different thoughts from a lot of different people. And I think that is ultimately what I'm trying to figure out now is, OK, we have all of these different ideas, a combination of which will make everybody happy and resolve all of these issues that the chain has right now, namely centralization and civil attacks where one B, one person has multiple VP slots. Um, but it's really a matter of, okay, how do we reach consensus as a community and, and implement one of these ideas? Mm -hmm. I, I, I appreciate all the thought leaders coming out on this. Uh, one of the reasons we haven't like dove into our full governance episode, we won't, we won't do a governance episode on a Friday for you guys. We won't bore you with that, but we will. Uh, once we come to our conclusions, there's just so much stuff coming out. Uh, there's a lot of back backdoor discussions. Like, what have you heard uh, as far as discussions going on behind the scenes amongst uh, these proposals, block producers, exchanges, whales? Like, what what have you been hearing on your end? Uh, it seems like the idea that's most popular from Dan's is the one that we pointed out, which is the yeah. staking pool idea. And I know a lot of people think the EOS New York pro proposal is a bit too complex, but in order to make a new 
sort of incentive model that does benefit everybody and solves a lot of these problems, I think you are going to have a relatively complex solution, even though once it's implemented, it's pretty simple and, and easy to understand. So uh, that's kind of the general consensus I'm hearing. I know uh, some people are not happy with the complete EOS New York proposal, so it will definitely take some kind of an amendment or sort of amalgamation of these ideas in order for us to reach consensus as a community. So what are, what are the next steps then? So once kind of everyone like in closed conversations, I guess, kind of comes to terms and says like, okay, this is a, a decent proposal. Is the next step a referendum? And then I, I know the referendum doesn't mean anything as far as token weight, but it's a way for the block producers to signal what they want to do to yeah. see what the top 21 want to do. I is think it? that would be the next step. I think it, ideally there would be some kind of a sort of almost like a governance board or like a group of volunteers that get together and say, hey, we're going to talk with all the BPs and sort of move this whole discussion forward and, and include everybody's thoughts and then uh, present a new updated proposal. I'm not sure if EOS New York is working on an updated version um, it, that includes feedback or if it'll have to be somebody else that puts that forward. But definitely you're right. Once we have that proposal or maybe multiple proposals, the block producers and token holders can signal on chain through the referendum system which ones they want. And then ultimately the BPs, 15 out of the top 21, can implement these upgrades and these changes. Uh, what, what are your, what, what's your opinion on timelines? I know US New York, when everything first came out, he said it could be up to a year. And then Brock was on a video with Max Dapp and he said like it needs fixed like ASAP. Like, like what kind of timelines do you put on phase one of these proposals, which would be, I guess, one token, one vote at this point? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard to gauge a timeline when it's hard to know what will make everyone happy, or at least the majority of people in the system happy, particularly the 15 out of top 21 who ultimately have to make this decision. They're the ones that have control over this process. Um, so it's hard to put a timeline on it. I do agree with Brock, it needs to happen as soon as possible. And I'm hoping it doesn't take up to a year. However, I am prepared for it to take that long or longer, um, depending on how long it takes us all to reach consensus. So it's it going to be tough to, to convince the 15 out of top 21 who are making money off of this system now to potentially risk that by moving to a new system, even though the incentives show that they could actually make more money, it's gonna to be tough to convince somebody to upgrade their cash cow to a potential cash cow 2.0 um, just to make that, that little I, bit of extra money. I, I've actually got a prop here. I've got the solution to EOS gov EOSIO and EOS governance. Let's hear it. Wipe, wipe, wash the, wipe the stink with the EOSIO deodorant <laughs> off of EOS governance. <laughs> so ridiculous. <laughs> I got to do apply, apply the deodorant. The stink will be gone in a couple months, folks. There we go. Um, Wouldn't but, it be but, great if it was that easy? Yeah, we, we, I mean, let, let's all go to Blocksburg. It's only 150 bucks now. We could have a breakout session. We could pull Dan to the side off, off the main stage. Be like, Dan, got to go in this room. We got to talk governance, man. There we go. I know uh, they had a, a breakout session at the uh, EOS community conference in Rio where people pitched different ideas, not just about governance, but about history API nodes and, and all kinds of stuff. So it seemed like a very productive time. Yeah, Pete, that deodorant is 13 months old. It's from the EOS Hackathon last November. But you know what? I save it for a special occasion, all right? I only wear antiperspirant. This is deodorant, man. It's only good go. for a governance stink. Uh, let's get in. So Dan, Dan, we talked about last week how he was like asking about like what the best enterprise blockchains are. And he was asking about like Hyperledger. And his, his, he says right in the tweet, I'll let you read it, but developers is his focus. Yeah, so Dan came out and said, EOSIO 2.0 with its optimized compiler is up to twice as fast as Wavum, which was recently tested to beat everything else hands down. Someone should update these benchmarks to test the three Wavum mod modes of EOS VM. And then, do you want to explain the, the tweet that he was quoting here? Yeah, there, there's some context here. I'm, I'm going to try to pull it up on on like the full screen here. But the guy, he was responding, he, he was like kind of, I don't want to say trolling, but he was correcting. He was, he was pulling a, a Doug on uh this this guy saying that the technology was the best i can't i can't find it basically uh frank yeah. dennis is that his name frank dennis yeah yep. he's basically a web assembly guy he's just like a like techie like if you go to his profile he's just like a regular tech guy has nothing to do with blockchain and he thinks he has the absolute fastest wasm compiler there is and it's it's because he, he didn't know about the ESVM and, and Dan's compiler. So Dan just came out and he's like, hey, hey, buddy, th this combination here is actually the fastest. And I think he's going to continue to do this because EOS IO and Block One, it, it, their, their goal is not to like take on other like crypto companies or blockchain companies that they're going after like technology. Like they want to be the tech stack of the future with EOS IO, like the next SQL database like it's going to be just a, as big of a household name hopefully as, as things like that um, okay so 
I have this guy's screen up here. Pull him up. Basically, he's uh, he's just some developer guy. He's got twelve and a half thousand followers, and like it's just a, a nerd post. Basically, it's just Dan being Dan, being a nerd, and it's all about the developers. You follow the developer, like none of this blockchain stuff is ever gonna make sense without the developers. Like the developers are everything. You go where the developers are, and this is not financial advice, but you're probably gonna gonna be happier if you go somewhere where it's just all noise and marketing, which is the opposite of what we see here. Uh, developers is, is where, where the meat is here, and that's where you want to focus. Oh, um, yeah. Well, and I think one of the biggest takeaways from this, too, that I took is that the fact that uh, Block One is building these compilers, you know, they're building these core building blocks from the ground up to optimize, shows that they're really committed to the long term success of EOS and ESIO, where they want to improve that sort of layer one solution as much as possible before they then try to scale this out horizontally. Um, I know Liquid Apps is already scaling it out horizontally, which uh, works pretty well. Um, but it, it's pretty exciting that they really are laying all the proper foundational building blocks in order to make this a, a long-term successful project. So uh, they're doing the right things. Speaking of developers, uh, every dApp and developer, if they didn't prepare properly today, which you said you did with the US name yes. service, uh, everyone's probably in a little bit of a crunch today with the Dexaram. I've mentioned a couple times the DDoS attack from the white hat I don't even know if you want to call him a hacker. He's just buying <laughs> CPU from Rex. Uh, you want to explain what, what he's doing to the network and what, what uh, effect it's having right now? Yeah, so effectively, this is a, uh, a bug, or not even a bug, an unintended consequence of having this sort of free threshold CPU where anybody can serve above, surge excuse me, above um, their, their guaranteed allocation of CPU on the network. So what that basically means is this guy is able to pay just a couple EOS, put two EOS into Rex to lease a bunch of CPU, and then he spams the network and basically locks a lot of people who don't have a lot of EOS staked out of using the network for a period of time. So it appears he's doing it again um, now that some of these uh, uh, new features are activated to see you know which dApps are prepared for this and which aren't. And while it can seem annoying in the moment, I think he is definitely doing a favor for the entire chain, doing a favor for block one so that things like EOS 1.8.5 can fix some of this uh, and potentially remove that free CPU threshold as well. I, I think if it's gonna happen, like right now, like th there's definitely some big dApps operating on EOS, but it's not like the the hundreds or thousands that, that we anticipate over the next like one to three years. So if it's gonna get DDoSed and mess things up and it, it, it doesn't have to mess things up. If you're a DAP developer, you could take precautions like EOS name service did like a lot like a lot of the uh, like uh, casinos have done. Like there's precautions you could take that like make this DDoS attack negligible. But the problem is it affects the majority of users uh, of retail like users because most people don't keep a lot of CPU staked. And that's yeah. kind of uh, it, it's because of the multiplier. So like typically with EOS, you get about a thousand X the CPU you actually own with the CPU you're staking. And once things go into congestion mode, you're basically just confined to the uh, resources you're paying for. And they're super cheap. You just have to to, to buy them in advance before these DDoS attacks happen. Uh, Definitely. Is, is there any fixes as far as this is concerned? I know some people proposed making it so that, like even if you're in congested mode and don't have enough CPU, like you could still stake more CPU maybe. Have you read right. about I that? Think I think that would be a solid suggestion, or maybe you could still use racks even if you don't have enough CPU to get more CPU, because that seems to be the issue is people get locked out um, and then they aren't able to send a transaction to give themselves more CPU. So something like that would be a great fix. I think the extreme version is removing that free CPU threshold entirely, where only what you stake is what you get. You can't surge above it. But that would also do things like give more predictable costs to DAP developers who are staking on the network. So I think there are pros and cons to that model, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how it unfolds. All right, we've been going a little bit long. Let's just kind of run through these last couple updates. We got some more yeah. DAP. We got some DAP updates. A uh, project we haven't talked about in a, a while, but we are the very first people to talk about it. All the way back on March fifteenth, uh, the Vigor Stablecoin project. I just wanted to point out that this team's been working hard since March. Uh, Andrew Bryan, he's a Harvard quant. He's one of the, uh, I don't know what employee number he was, but he's one of the uh, first employees at MakerDAO, which is, uh, if you guys are familiar, it's one of the biggest dApps on Ethereum uh, for collateral backed stable coins and DAI. So basically this, t this team's been operating as a DAC, uh, which basically means it it's a decentralized group of people just kind of all chipping in and they've been doing it all, all voluntary. So now that they finally hit new decks, uh, I, I appreciate that uh, bleh, I, the, the team could finally uh, kind of start, 
I don't want to say, I guess it is liquidating. It's just like a block producer. So on, on Vigor, I, I think the best way to describe a custodian is it's like each custodian is like a block producer on EOS. Whenever you have a block producer, they earn block rewards and they usually sell those block rewards to pay their employees and their developers for all of the things they're buy, are building. And whereas with the Vigor stablecoin, they've got 21 uh, custodians. They include like Mblue Crypto, Michael Yeats from EOS DAC, uh, Andrew Bryan himself, a, a bunch of other guys, uh, Josh Brown. Uh, they, they've all just been basically putting sweat equity into this. And now uh, the projects, I, I, I don't know the exact timeline, but it seems like the roadmap is actually closer than I thought as far as when uh, the product will be ready to launch. And it, it's really cool because I'm always excited about these stablecoin projects. Before uh, we even on the air and you knew that, that this was a topic, you were talking about stablecoins. Yeah. Uh, Equilibrium has had me excited since they announced their launch back in April. That's a very similar project to Vigor. Uh, but the thing with Vigor that's cool is they're multi-collateral, which is uh, something that MakerDAO actually pointed out at DevCon uh, when they're in Japan like a week or two weeks ago. And being multi-collateral basically means that your entire, like you could have multiple assets in your wallet all be collateralized for like the same positions. It's, it's really freaking complicated stuff. I, I didn't want to even talk. I, I said I wasn't going to talk that much about this because I like to be an expert on topics that I really dive deep into. But this thing's on another level. I highly recommend you check it out. I'm not saying buy tokens. Just go check out the project and read about it because uh, the innovation that's happening there is super, super interesting and innovative. And the fact that it's happening as a DAC uh, is super impressive because... Absolutely. Like, well, and and speaking of DAX and speaking of stable coins as well, Equilibrium will finally yes. now vote for 30 block producers in their proxy that has 4.3 million EOS. So that's exciting. Something I think they should have done a long time ago when the community <laughs> complained. Uh, they limited it to 10 for, for no apparent reason. Um, but now it's going back up to 30. So shout out to Equilibrium for doing that and uh, making the right choice there. And then uh, I think the last thing we wanted to talk about um, is a tweet I put out about Backed, where when Backed launched, and this is the uh, the new sort of Bitcoin trading desk from the makers or from the owners rather of the New York Stock Exchange, that's ICE, um, coming out and, and basically offering these Bitcoin futures that are physically settled, meaning you have to deliver it in Bitcoin, not in cash, offering this to institutions. It's the now largest institutional on-ramp in terms of the access that all of these institutions have to it. And what's exciting about it is that a few weeks ago, people were incredibly impatient. They were doing like 50 Bitcoin in volume a day. Uh, you know, These things with institutions takes a long time. It takes some time to do due diligence. And now we're starting to see the fruits of back, or at least the initial uh, sort of hints of fruits where back continues to hit a new all-time high in volume uh, every day for the last few days. Uh, today, it looks like it's projected to hit almost 2,000 Bitcoin in daily trading volume. So it's exciting and, and should continue to grow over time. <laughs> I'm just reading through the comments. Uh, Equilibrium is the DeFi is a DeFi killer. I agree with that. E Equilibrium is an awesome project. I think I, I guess I will point out they they wanted me to mention they'll be doing a DeFi conference. I think next month. I I don't have the dates or anything in front of me, but that's an Equilibrium thing. I think Galia from Bancor is going to be talking there too. Uh, anything else? The Vigor website needs work. That's 100% correct. It is a DAC building this, and they've been doing it with no funding. All their funding has basically been going towards legal. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, their, their, their website needs some work. If you're a web designer, apply as a custodian, and you could actually get paid to do the web design work for the, the, the Vigor project. Absolutely. I think uh, the last thing I'll say is uh, just a quick reminder, head on over to eosnameservice.io, get your new .dsp, .trade, .jobs, or .nl names. Uh, I've seen a couple go go through uh, as we've been on the show, so exciting time. I bought, with the Bitcoin pump today, I bought a Lambo. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. That's nice. I got all kinds of props today. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'm rolling, rolling with the Hot Wheels Lambo now. Uh, so I guess that's it, man. Hopefully uh, what happened this morning with the popping of the market, uh, not financial advice, but hopefully it continues. Not saying a buy, not saying a sell, but I'm excited to uh, look at a chart for, for the first time in a couple of days. So we'll see what happens. Absolutely. There. Yeah, uh, we'll guess. see how it goes. Uh, what I do we do here, Rob? I, th I think this is where we say, uh, until next week, guys, I'm Zach Gall. I'm Rob Finch. And this, this is Everything, is everything Eos. Eos. Go, go Eos. Eos! Leave a Go Eos in the chat. We'll see you next time.